Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Terry Johnson. I'm a partner in Morgan Lewis's uh, Labor and Employment Practice Group, and I have the privilege of serving as the managing partner of the firm's Princeton, New Jersey office. Uh, one of my other hats, I have the privilege of being on one of the firms mobilizing for equality working groups is to group uh, the, the conversations on privilege and anti-racism. We are excited to welcome you here today and welcome the National Constitution Center and distinguished guests uh, to, to today's session. Today's session is Reconstruction Amendments, Historical Context, and Modern Meaning. It should be a really exciting and informative session, and we're really glad you had joined us today. Our firm has a long history of collaborating with the National Constitution Center. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, 25 years ago, we celebrated the firm's 125th anniversary. And as part of that anniversary, we were instrumental in founding uh, the, uh, the National Constitution Center. This year, 25 years later, we celebrate our 150th anniversary. In honor of that milestone, we decided to continue that great tradition of partnering with the National Constitution Center. And we are proud to have provided funding to allow the, the Constitution Center to kick off a series of civic education seminars like this one for lawyers across the nation. These nonpartisan education seminars will allow us to promote civil dialogue around the Constitution, its meaning, its application, both inside the United States and also its influence outside the United States. So again, Happy you're here. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I'll kick it to uh, my colleague, Michelle Park Chu. Thank you, Terry. I'm Michelle Park Chu. I'm a partner in our antitrust practice group in San Francisco. And I also have the honor of serving as the co-chair of our firm's Mobilizing for Equality Leadership Committee. Today's program is going to take us back to the decade when Mr. Morgan and Mr. Bacchius, our firm's founders, pulled their desks into the same room and founded our firm in 1873. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, sometimes referred to as the Reconstruction or Civil War Amendments, were proposed and ratified in the United States between 1865 and 1870. Obviously, the importance of these amendments cannot be overstated, and their intent is being debated 150 years later after their passing. Today, we wanted to give you a sense of what it might have been like to practice at that time, particularly if you were a person of color, and hear about the historical context and the modern meaning of these transformational additions to our Constitution. Thank you for joining us today. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Tom Donnelly from the NCC. Thank you so much, Michelle and Terry, for that wonderful introduction to our conversation today. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. My name is Tom Donnelly. I am the Chief Content Officer at the National Constitution Center. For those of you who don't know us, the National Constitution Center is a private nonprofit which brings together people of all ages and all perspectives to learn about, debate, and celebrate the U.S. Constitution. You can visit our museum in Philadelphia, or you can visit us online where we have you know, resources for pretty much anyone who's interested in basically any topic on the Constitution. We pride ourselves in bringing together the best thinkers on all sides of the issue to give you the best information possible to make your own decisions about the constitutional issues at the center of American life. I'd also like to thank Morgan Lewis for inviting the Constitution Center to participate in today's program. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first uh, first panelist, who is, uh, and he's you know, going to discuss the, the legal profession in the 19th century and his own inspiring scholarship on the first African-American lawyer admitted to the Supreme Court bar, John Rock. So our panelist is Christopher Brooks. He's a professor of history at East Stroudsburg University, and he's just published a superb new article in the Journal of Supreme Court History entitled Senator Charles Sumner and the Admission of John S. Rock to the Supreme Court Bar. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris. Now, as I've already said, you've written so powerfully about John Rock, but before we get to him, I'd like to start with just a little level setting. I mean, broadly speaking, how did the legal profession itself compare in the Civil War and Reconstruction era to the legal profession we have today, both more generally, but particularly for African-Americans? You know, when we start to compare different time periods, it's uh, kind of difficult. That said, um, with respect to African Americans, well, well, actually, I can say that you know the <clears throat> firms were generally no more than three people. 
uh, for starters. Uh, that starts to change once you get really post World War One. You start to see a shift in the profession. But prior to that, looking at African Americans, um, there weren't many black lawyers. Uh, the first, Macon Bowling Allen, um, was uh, qualified as an attorney in Maine in 1844, and then subsequently in um, <clears throat> in Massachusetts in 1845. Uh, Macon Bowling Allen's story is uh, kind of an interesting one. In fact, he had no transportation from Boston to Worcester where he had to um, take the bar, so he walked. Uh, I believe it's 1920 some odd miles. Uh, yeah, so he walked it uh, and he passed. Uh, and he also had to the question, uh, extremely difficult, almost, yeah, pretty much. He had no chance of earning money because no one would hire him. Remember, <clears throat> even though Beacon Hill in Boston was where this, you know, the words of uh, James Horton, the Black Brahmins uh, resided, uh, there was only so much money to go around and it wasn't much to live on. However, the second African American attorney. <clears throat> in uh, Massachusetts and also in the United States, uh, who was admitted in 1847, that was Robert Morse. Now, Robert Morse is, uh, based on any records I can find, the first African-American attorney to earn a living with it. He was serving the African-American population, but again, not a lot of money there, but also the Irish immigrant population. Morse is kind of an oddity, because again, I mean, the money has to come from somewhere, right? So in the African-American community, though comparatively better off than those in chains, eh, there wasn't a whole lot of capital flying around. Absolutely. So now that's it's an interesting, uh, uh, speaking to the origins of the of African Americans in the legal profession. Maybe now let's turn to, you know, your hero here, John Locke, the hero of your story. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about, before we get to his admission story, tell us a little bit about John Rock, the person, his biography, what he accomplished, which was quite a bit, even before he was admitted to the Supreme Court Bar. Give us a sense of John Rock, the man, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, his admission to the Supreme Court Bar. So John Stuart Rock was born in um, a small town right, right in Salem County, New Jersey. Um, and Rock I mean, he was, you know, it was pretty much discovered to be rather erudite early on. Uh, his, he had a, one parent was a freed, freed slave and the other one had been born free. I think his mother had been freed. His father was a day laborer in, uh, through, in Salem. Um, Rock attended school, a Quaker school, the Quakers, you know, in that, that part of New Jersey. And eventually, Rock comes to become, a, he, he will become a teacher in that school, and then subsequently the director of that school. <clears throat> and he's a director of the school by the time he's 20 years old. Uh, he wanted to go to medical school. He was rejected based on his race, school in Philadelphia. and. He decided in, to instead study to become a dentist, which was through apprenticeship at that time. Um, the man who under whom he uh, studied to become a dentist, a man named Harbert, was pretty prominent, had published some sizable uh, sort of teaching manuals in dentistry and orthodontics. By 1852, or no, 50, 152. He was admitted into the, uh, the Eclectic Medical College of uh, Philadelphia, which, you know, I think was in existence for maybe 15 years. But he completed, he graduated, practiced medicine in Philadelphia. He and his wife eventually moved to Massachusetts, to Boston, Beacon Hill. That's where, and it's really from there where he becomes quite famous. <clears throat> 
so <clears throat> he he was practicing medicine, was heavily involved in the abolitionist movement, um, delivering lyceum speeches. Um, later on, he'll be heavily involved in recruiting troops for the 54th, the famous 54th Regiment. Uh, and, and then subsequently after the war, um, petitioning Congress to make sure that the um, that the soldiers were taken care of, the African-American soldiers were compensated justly, um, which, well, that's a discussion perhaps for another time. But I guess we want to get to the law part. So he, so he had become a teacher, school director, um, dentist, and physician. So why did he end up studying the law and practicing law? So Rock would um, he, he develop tuberculosis. Now, um, what it had to do with was his dexterity. And there's with tuberculosis, apparently there's a, one of the, um, the way it manifests itself has to do with dexterity. So surgery or certain medical procedures he can no longer carry out. So he does, however, go to France to discover all of this. Uh, so he, how does he go to France in 1858? Mind you, what happened in 1857 with the Dred Scott decision. So how does he get a passport? Enter Charles Sumner. Um, and that, I mean, he and Sumner had through correspondence and being involved in this organization that they kind of crossed paths by this point. But <clears throat> Sumner, you know, really strongly advocates for him to uh, get a, uh, you know, the visa and whatnot to travel to France, uh, the Massachusetts legislature will, will pass a law uh, to <clears throat> afford them the ability to grant <laughs> the visas and, and the like. And now, now, mind you, in the 1850s, you know, to the consternation of men like Louis Cass, this was possible. This is not possible anymore, obviously. I mean, the bureaucracy is what it is. Um, but at that time, you know, to the benefit of John Rock, he was able to get a passport, does travel to France, um, is treated by these two French physicians, Neoton and Verpu, uh, and he returns back uh, to Boston, could no longer practice medicine or tries briefly, but couldn't. And he ends up, you know, studying for the bar, passing the bar in 1861. And he practices law in Suffolk County, Massachusetts. Um, from any records I can see, he was he was the fourth um, black attorney, I believe fourth, in Massachusetts. And I think the sixth or seventh in United States history. So there weren't many. <laughs> there, there really weren't. There was a real paucity of them. But um, yeah, so that's in a nutshell um, how he comes to practice law. That's excellent. Thank you so much for that context, Chris. And we, we only have sadly a, a few minutes left here, but maybe if you could just talk a little bit, bring us up to that moment uh, where he becomes, where he's admitted to the Supreme Court, say a little bit about you know, who had pushed for that, and then the powerful moment when he finally is admitted to the Supreme Court. Really, he's the one who pushed for it. And he was really persistent about it. There's a series of, I believe, yeah, 12 letters between he and Sumner. I think about eight or nine of them have to do with him, uh, his admission to the Supreme Court bar. Now, mind you, um, you, know, you practicing attorneys out there, you know that it's almost pro forma. You know, you serve your three years in good standing. A uh, a member of the of the SCOTUS bar, you know, recommends you, and you go down there, and it's a wonderful ceremony, and voila, you are allowed to practice before the highest court in the land. Wasn't so simple for John. <laughs> um, again, you know, Tony was on the bench when you know he was admitted in Suffolk County to be an attorney. Um, you know, Tawny passes away in uh, October of 1864. So 
uh, you know, he's up, <laughs> he's really up against it, big time. And so, so what we discover, what we see is this letter, one of the letters where Rock had written to Sumner as he's kind of saying, hey, you know, why don't you put my name forward? Why don't you put my name forward? Why don't you put my, recommend me, recommend me? And one of the letters that he, he, he suggests about Tony is that the old man lives out of spite. <laughs> so um, anyway, Tony passes away as we, you know, the, those who study this period of history all know, Sam of Portland Chase becomes chief. And uh, Sam of Portland Chase um, also had an extensive record of abolitionism going back to his time as a practicing attorney in Cincinnati and um, really uh, actually risked his life, in fact, uh, with, with uh, trying to protect the runaway slaves. So, you know, Rock and uh, <clears throat> Senator Sumner recognize this and Rock um, says, hey, wait, you know, this is our time and, you know, Chase is a is a good man, and this is our opportunity. So that is really when the push really takes off at the end of 1864 into um, 1865. And by February 1st, 1865, he is indeed admitted. Uh, the, the those months, especially uh, December of 64, in January of 65, it's kind of like this frenetic back and forth between Rock and Sumner. Oh, frenetic might be a bit much. I guess for the times and the speed at which um, communication was transported from point A to point B, it was kind of frenetic. Uh, where Rock's saying, hey, you know, I'm on my way, you know, and um, well, don't come yet. And, Ch and then you got Sam in Portland, you know, they got Chief uh, Chase writing to Senator Sumner saying, wait, you know, tell this guy to slow down, right? And so it, it, there's this real back and forth, whoa, this guy's got to kind of slow down. Yeah, but you have to think from, from Rock's perspective, he's like, I've been, we, uh, we black people have been waiting long enough, you know, let's, let's get there. Um, yeah, and mind you, I'm saying all of this. Now, Rock was born in 1825, um, right? So he's like barely 40. Now, he's been a school teacher, school director, dentist, physician, and now attorney about to join the Supreme Court Bar during, during the Civil War. And the fact that he even lived to talk about it is amazing. The sad part is that he did not live long enough to actually try a case before the court. He died tuberculosis the following year in 1866. But he left a long legacy of real advocacy. Um, he's he's uh, credited with not coining the term, but the concept of black is beautiful in a speech he had delivered in uh, 1858. I will sink or swim with my race, I think is the title of the speech. So yeah. Well, Chris Brooks, for sharing John Rock's extraordinary life with us, I thank you so much. Wish we had more time to speak, but uh, that was a fascinating, illuminating discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you. And now, so thank you so much, Chris. That was, I learned so much about John Rock and the legal profession in the 19th century. Now we're going to turn our discussion more broadly to the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, the Reconstruction Amendments, and their enduring legacy. And to help lead this conversation, I'd love, I'm, I, it's my pleasure to introduce two award-winning historians of the era. First, we have Alan Gelzo, who is the Senior Research Scholar at the Council of the Humanities at Princeton University. He's the author of countless books on Abraham Lincoln, the Civil War, Reconstruction, including Reconstruction, a Concise History, and his forthcoming book is Our Ancient Faith, Lincoln, Democracy, and the American Experiment. So, Alan, thank you so much for joining us. And Manisha Sinha is the Draper Chair in American History at the University of Connecticut. She wrote an extraordinary book on the history of American slavery, The Slaves' Cause, A History of Abolition, 
Her forthcoming book is a history of reconstruction titled The Rise and Fall of the Second American Republic Reconstruction, 1816 to 1920. Thank you for joining us, Alan Gelso and Manisha Sinha. Thank you for having us. So I'd like to, as I said, just use our time together to really drill into the history of the Reconstruction Amendments. But I'd like to begin with more of a big picture question, which is, you know, we saw this past term, justices on the Supreme Court from across the ideological spectrum describing Reconstruction as America's second founding. So perhaps borrowing from the famous Eric Foner book of the same name. But uh, Manisha Sinha, beginning with you, you know, you've just completed a new book on, on, on the history of Reconstruction. Do you agree with that label for Reconstruction, a second founding, sort of why or why or why not? Well, I do call it the Second American Republic. Uh, and so you can imagine that my um, that I'm quite sympathetic to that view. Um, and of course, Eric Foner was my mentor at Columbia University. So um, yes, um, and the fact that both Justices Jackson and Sotomayor uh, referred to his work the second founding, you know, we, we historians don't get cited enough in Supreme Court decisions, that's our opinion. Uh, and he was cited by both of them uh, in order to recapitulate the long history of reconstruction uh, and the long afterlives of both slavery and Jim Crow in this country it was quite extraordinary. And uh, oddly enough, um, uh, Clarence Thomas also cited Eric Foner's the second founding, uh, but as he uh, put it here, it took an isolated fact from the book um, to render a very different history of both Reconstruction uh, and, the, and the long history of, of racism in the country. So, um, you know, it was interesting for me to see Eric Fona being cited by both sides in this particular Supreme Court case. Uh, and I do think um, the second founding is uh, is an, an accurate description of the period of Reconstruction, not the least because our Constitution is remade in such fundamental ways with the three Reconstruction Amendments. But I should point out that even before we historians started writing about this period, abolitionists, uh, anti-slavery men and women, were referring to the Civil War as the Second American Revolution, uh, and were referring to a new beginning for American democracy uh, during Reconstruction. Well, thank you so much for that reminder as well. I mean, as you said, just, it's Justices Sotomayor, Jackson, Thomas, even Chief Justice Roberts referred to Reconstruction as a second American founding. So same question, just to kick it off here to you, Alan Gelzo. Do you uh, agree with that label? Do you think it's apt? Uh, if, uh, you know, why or why not? Well, I think it's an interesting metaphor but I don't think it's a literal description because if we're talking in literal terms, then that sounds a great deal like we're talking about the same thing we find in French constitutional and legal history, where you have a first republic, second, third, fourth, fifth republic. And in each case, a different constitution is being written for those different republics. We don't write a different constitution uh, in Reconstruction or at really at any other point. We are still operating, for the most part, under the Constitution that was devised in 1787. If there was a second founding, if there was a second Constitution, um, then the name of it is the Confederate States of America, because they did write a new Constitution, because they recognized that the old Constitution did not serve their purposes. So when they secede or attempt to secede from the Union, what they do is to, they rewrite a constitution. Now that definitely is a second republic in a literal sense. So I will agree with Manisha about the, the metaphor. There are different interpretive directions that are taken. There is a different ethos that the constitution is viewed in from era to era. Literally speaking, I think we might get ourselves into a certain amount of grief because at least it's certainly not like the literal changes in a republic or a constitution that we find, as I say, in France. The curiosity is the people who are most likely in Reconstruction times to talk about a second founding are the people who are doing their best to, to obstruct the application of the Reconstruction Amendments. And I think that's particularly, um, particularly at the fore uh, when we talk about the slaughterhouse cases uh, which are a primary 
uh, case in considering the Reconstruction Amendments, and especially 14th Amendment. Uh, John Campbell, who was the lead counsel in uh, the case of the butchers who are making their appeal uh, to the 14th Amendment, Campbell is making his argument on the basis that the 14th Amendment is, in fact, a complete refounding, a complete reorganization of the law of the land, but he's doing it with intent that I think that both Manisha and I would have severe problems with. Uh, we're not we're not too eager to be found on the same pew uh, with John A. Campbell, because what Campbell was was really trying to do ultimately was to subvert uh, what was perceived as the very specific intention of the Fourteenth Amendment about securing the rights, the franchises, the privileges and immunities uh, of those who had been slaves. And Campbell's operating against that, and he will want to invoke this idea of a second founding uh, precisely to stymie any further progress along those lines. So, uh, Minister Sinha, please feel free to sort of respond to anything that that uh, Professor Gelzo said there in his response. But I mean, more broadly, I'd like to place, you know, some of the intellectual forerunners of the Reconstruction Amendments on the table. And you've written, as I've already said, a powerful history of American uh, slavery, where you focused especially on the role of African Americans in the push towards emancipation. You know, how do the strands of constitutional and political thought within the African American community inform the key principles that we ultimately write into the Reconstruction Amendments? Um, that's a very good question. You know, I would agree with Professor Gelzo that uh, the Confederacy was not much of a republic nor much of a nation, rather a misbegotten one. Um, you know, I um, have written extensively about the abolitionist movement, as you have pointed out, um, which, is, which was a radical interracial social movement. Uh, and normally when we think about uh, political history, we do not think of activists on the ground moving the needle in terms of politics or law. Uh, but if you look at the abolitionist debate over the nature of the United States Constitution, some that, you know, contemporary lawyers and historians are still having um, about the place of slavery in the U.S. Constitution, they're the ones who initiate many of the principles that become a part of the Reconstruction Amendments, the notion of equal protection before the law, the notion of having a national standard for citizenship. Um, naturalize or birthright. Uh, those ideas are being debated by abolitionists uh, pretty much from the revolution to the Civil War. I talk about the two phases of the abolition movement um, during the revolutionary era and then in the antebellum, those years before the Civil War. Um, and so I argue uh, in my forthcoming book, but also my previous book on abolition, that it is really the abolitionists who are experimenting with and coming up with these ideas. And African-Americans are making these freedom claims in courts throughout the North. They are the ones who are pushing for Northern states to pass personal liberty laws to give them certain protections, whether it is trial by jury or able to give testimony in court, um, or just you know, some of the basic civil and political rights that become enshrined in the constitution uh, during reconstruction. So these are the forgotten historical origin points uh, of this story. And, and many men uh, like Thaddeus Stephen and Charles Sumner had very close contacts to the abolition movement, uh, to African-Americans. They had fought fugitive slave cases. So had Salmon P. Chase who became chief justice. Um, under the Lincoln administration. It was fitting that, you know, here was a great abolitionist constitutional thinker who succeeded the avatar of pro-slavery constitutionalism, uh, Roger Tawney. Um, and so these ideas were debated so hotly in abolitionist and anti-slavery circles, and they really come to a fruition uh, during Reconstruction. And it is Sumner's vision, uh, maybe Professor Gelzer wouldn't approve too much. He was very influenced by French republicanism and the idea of equality of all persons. And he wanted to establish the, that national standard. But there were also moderates like John Bingham who put this into practice. So the 14th amendment really nationalizes our first eight amendments. You know, he's the one who comes up with the term bill of rights also. Uh, the first uh, few amendments to the Constitution are not called Bill of Rights before John Bingham talks about this. So these men 
uh, in Congress, and I've read all those debates in the Cong Congressional Globe, as I'm sure Professor Gelzo has also, have a very expansive egalitarian notion of citizenship. And the reason why I see this as indeed the second American Republic, again, something as Professor Gelzer astutely noted, borrowed from the history of French Republicanism is because um, they are very uh, conscious of trying to replace um, the slaveholding Republic with an interracial democracy. Uh, and the reason why many of these amendments and federal civil rights laws, including the civil rights law of 1866, under which cases are still adjudicated, and the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which unfortunately, unfortunately the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional, um, you know, they were very conscious of creating a new standard for citizenship. And they were challenging certain verities about states' rights uh, that pro-slavery politicians had used to justify or invent a constitutional right to secession. Um, so I think it's important to see this as a formative period in uh, the history of American constitutionalism uh, and the law. Um, and the reason why many people still today are uncomfortable with the notion of national birthright citizenship or uh, basing many of our modern rights on the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause is precisely because just as they were contested then, they're still being contested today. Excellent. Oh, Manisha, so now you put, you put so many things on the table here. You put some of the architects of the Reconstruction Amendment's vision, like Charles Sumner and John Bingham on the table. You've placed the Supreme Court's role in interpreting the Reconstruction Amendments, what Professor Gelzo did as well in those early years on the table as well, and also modern debates over the Reconstruction Amendments on the table. Hopefully we can get to, uh, to each of those topics. Uh, but before we get there, Professor Gelzo, I, I, of course, please feel free to respond to anything that Professor Sinha just said. Uh, you know, but more broadly, you're also obviously one of America's, the world's, you know, great experts on Abraham Lincoln. And, you know, Lincoln himself, shortly before his assassination, pushed hard for the uh, congressional approval of the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. I mean, he even went so far as although the president has no role in the process to sign his name to the amendment before sending it along to the states for ratification, calling it a king's cure for the evils of slavery. Uh, but of course, Lincoln tragically is murdered before the ratification of the 13th Amendment, before the framing and ratification of the 14th and 15th Amendment. As we're thinking about the Reconstruction Amendments, you know, how much do you view them as really being drawn, the principles being drawn from the Civil War experience and the constitutional vision of Lincoln versus there being, you know, more the product of the generation that comes after him? Well, I want to pick up a thread of what uh, Manisha was saying, because what the abolitionists are, are doing really is a debating hall for what is going to be the future of constitutional law. And, and really, you can trace the threads of the kinds of discussions that abolitionists are promoting, even as far back as the last decade of the 18th century. There are people who talk, who are already talking in those terms, who are saying, look, we've had this revolution, we have this Declaration of Independence, it's talking about equality. But when we look around us, we do not see a lot of equality. We need to get things lined up. We need to put our realities more in order with our aspirations. Uh, so there is a long discussion here. And there's, there's tremendous internal debate, even within the abolitionists, about how to go about things. What, what are the, the rationales? What are the personalities? And you have people who at one point are strongly allied with each other. And then at another point, they find themselves radically divided from, from each other. I think in this case of Frederick Douglass and, and William Lloyd Garrison. Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison very much start out on the same page, but after a passage of time, and there's a number of personal issues that enter into it as well, just to make it more complicated. Douglas and Garrison go a very separate way. And the same thing happens with other factions within the abolitionist movement. When you arrive at someone like Lincoln, you're actually looking at someone who doesn't even really want to wear the abolitionist label. So when you take all of these debates as a whole, what you get is a spectrum of opinion that sometimes can almost seem at odds with itself. Lincoln won't consider himself an abolitionist, but then he'll turn around and say, yes, 
but I'm mighty near one. And he will say to Charles Sumner at one point, the difference between you and me on this subject is six weeks. So uh, how to measure the intensity of these debates? Well, it shows up, I think, in large measure as we move towards the end of the Civil War itself. And Lincoln is throwing out all kinds of possibilities. He's talking about public education. He's talking about voting rights. And then, of course, he's assassinated. But even with that, the discussion is going forward. The question it becomes for people is, how do we make this happen? And I think what you see a great deal of in the, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, especially in the 14th and 15th Amendments, is a certain improvisation. How do we go about not just abolishing slavery, but how do we move beyond that to a real environment of equal rights? And some people are happy to stop with the 13th Amendment and go no further. Other people look at this and say, no, we've got to take more secure steps. We have a president and Andrew Johnson who can't be relied upon. We have new regimes in the South that are just resurrecting the old white supremacist regimes. They're inventing black codes. So perhaps congressional legislation. Now you get the Civil Rights Act of 1866. But then there are people who say, no, a Civil Rights Act is fine, but it's only statutory. If there's a change in Congress, it can be repealed. No, we need an amendment. This is why John Bingham, for instance, actually opposes the Civil Rights Act of 1866, not because he's opposed to its content, but because he's afraid it's not enough. We need a constitutional amendment. And we get the 14th Amendment, the longest, the most complex of all amendments to the Constitution. And even there, once we've got the 14th Amendment finished, even then it turns out, oh, wait, we forgot something. And then we have to move to the 15th Amendment. People in the years immediately after the Civil War find themselves on unpredictable territory. How do they negotiate it? How do they negotiate with each other? Sometimes it's the unity that impresses us, and I'm impressed in, at many points as well, with a character like Charles Sumner, one of the really genuinely admirable figures who emerges out of these years. I also, I also cannot miss the divisions and the quarrels that arise within. So it's moving into a, such a new environment, and the amendments reflect that uncertainty and that newness and that improvisation. Excellent. So we, we focus, especially, so we, we talked about the role of uh, antebellum abolitionist thought, anti-slavery thought. We've talked a bit about the Emancipation Amendment a little bit about civil rights and the 14th Amendment. I'd also like to now place on the table the importance of the right to vote to this story as well, um, and the framing and ratification of the 15th Amendment, ratified in 1870, which promised to uh, end racial discrimination in voting. Uh, you know, but it's just, you know, you know, obviously African-Americans had been pushing for the right to vote for decades. Uh, why were voting rights and political equality so important to the African-American community, but also, you know, the last in this series of, of, of three amendments that we see during Reconstruction? And then more broadly, can you just talk a little bit about the level of political participation we see from the African-American community at the height of Reconstruction, how long that lasted and why that was so, uh, so important and frankly, so inspiring today as well? Absolutely. Um, so the right to vote is it was central to many people, including African Americans and women at this time, who are also contending for the right to vote um, as as a, as a very crucial and important feature of Republican citizenship. It's not as if you are subject to the British Crown, right? Uh, since Jacksonian democracy, at least, the right to vote seems to define, um, you know, adult manhood suffered defined citizenship. Uh, and in fact, black men could vote in the early Republic if they had met the property holding requirements. With the spread of Jacksonian democracy, the right to vote is taken away from them in certain places like Connecticut, the place where I teach, and Pennsylvania. Uh, and many Northern states that enter into the union do not give black men the right to vote. In, in New York, they remove the property holding qualifications uh, for white men, but retain it for black men. Uh, so there's a patchwork, you can see. Each state is pretty much deciding what will be the requirements for voting uh, and for giving the right to vote uh, to a person. 
what reconstruction does is it establishes a national standard um, of both for civil and political rights with the first federal civil rights laws, but also with these amendments. The 15th amendment that no person can be deprived of the right to vote, uh, that vote should not be abridged by the states as it says on the basis of race, color or previous condition of servitude. Um, it does not include sex. It does not include gender, which enrages some women suffragists uh, who want this moment of constitution building to include women too, especially because they have been so active uh, in the abolition movement. And, and many of those who oppose giving black men the right to vote uh, try to act the spoiler by actually saying, okay, we, we will put women's right to vote there too, so that this amendment fails. But those tactics in the end do not succeed in Congress. Um, but the reason why I call the 19th Amendment the last Reconstruction Amendment is because I see this debate over suffrage and voting and citizenship beginning right then at the end of the Civil War and Reconstruction. And this is what, to go back to Professor Gelso's points, uh, brings me to, to Lincoln. You know, as, as Professor Gelso mentioned, Lincoln is an anti-slavery moderate politician, but it is really during the war and during Reconstruction, that he moves significantly towards the notion of Black citizenship. He becomes the first American president to publicly endorse Black citizenship and Black men, certainly soldiers, those who are educated, to get the right to vote. And this is why I argue in my book and many articles that I've written on him, that you know he, he was not an abolitionist, but he kind of lands on abolitionist ground. And it's the reason why uh, John Wilkes Booth assassinates him, not for emancipation, but for his last speech in which he says, you know, these black men should get the right to vote after having performed the duties of American citizenship, they should get the rights uh, of citizenship. Uh, and it's the reason why I see Lincoln as our first reconstruction president. His support for the 13th amendment, his, the, the path-breaking legislation that is passed during Lincoln's administration uh, during the Civil War, and also the creation of the Freedmen's Bureau. All this that we associate with Reconstruction really gets a head start uh, with Lincoln. Um, and so if we look at the right to vote as that essential component of citizenship, then we really need to look at uh, presidents who first advocated it and certainly uh, the constitutional amendments that, that broaden the purview of the right to vote. Um, the tragedy, of course, is that all this is uh, simply ignored in the southern states, uh, which establish a new regime of racial terror and Jim Crow, disfranchised Black men, debt peonage, sharecropping, criminalized Black freedom, develop tactics and methods to prevent Black men and later on women from voting. Um, and this is a, a, a point that is somewhat in contestation even today. And this is why I say there's a sleeping giant in the 14th Amendment, which clearly one section, I think section two, that says any state that abridges the right to vote of its citizens will suffer a loss of representation in Congress. That was never triggered during the Jim Crow years. It's not triggered now. But the idea that states can uh, through legal chicanery and devices, whether it was originally poll taxes, so-called grandfather clause, literacy clauses, and today through other ways, through acute ger gerrymandering or um, voter suppression, uh, through just you know, fiddling around with the state's electoral laws. Um, I think that is something that the reconstruction amendments and the reconstruction Congresses tried to address, but it is a problem that we still live with today. Professor Sin has talked, placed on the table, you know, not just the um, the power of the Reconstruction Amendments, but also the collapse of Reconstruction as we get later and later into the 19th century and into the early 20th century. Professor Gelzo, you already in your opening remarks commented on the slaughterhouse cases. Maybe more broadly, can you t talk about um, uh, the role of the Reconstruction Court and their early interpretations of the Reconstruction Amendments as, as a part of this uh, important story? Tom, during the Civil War, one of the uh, surprising silences, and the war generates a lot of noise in more ways than one, but one of the surprising silences is the Supreme Court. 
the Supreme Court actually does very little in the way of jurisprudence during the Civil War. Uh, one reason is because Abraham Lincoln makes sure that a lot of cases don't get to them. He does not trust the result of a court whose chief justice is Roger Tawney. And I have to say, he was entirely right. It's after the war, and yes, after the death of Abraham Lincoln, that the Supreme Court revs back into life. We talk a lot about the separation of powers in the Constitution. We don't often focus on the rivalry between those powers, between those branches. And while we understand that there's always been a certain jockeying between the executive branch and the legislative branch, and that was certainly true of a Reconstruction, by the way, because there was a very serious argument as to who had the authority to give direction to Reconstruction. Was it the executive branch? Was it the legislative branch? But there's also then the judicial branch. And the Supreme Court comes roaring back to life after the war, determined to reassert its prerogatives vis-a-vis -vis the other two branches. So you get a flurry of cases of striking down uh, congressional legislation in less than 10 years after the end of the Civil War. The Supreme Court has struck down a dozen statutes that are passed by Congress. And that, I mean, that's unprecedented compared with the pre-Civil War court. Uh, what you see then in the court is this effort to put its own hand into the definition of Reconstruction. And probably you see it in the largest sense in the slaughterhouse cases uh, in 1873. So we're actually literally on the 150th anniversary. If you can call it an anniversary, it sounds like something to celebrate, but it's not, uh, of, of the slaughterhouse cases. And the slaughterhouse case, a very complex case, I won't, I won't take us deep into the weeds on it, but it's a very complex case that ends up circumscribing some of the application of the 14th Amendment. And it is a circumscription that, in fact, we still deal with today. Because as we move, let's say, into the 1950s, we're talking about civil rights legislation. The results of the slaughterhouse cases in interpreting the 14th Amendment prove to be a serious difficulty, a serious obstacle, and moving ahead with civil rights and voting rights legislation in the 1960s, there has to be a maneuver around the precedent that is set by Slaughterhouse. So these cases coming uh, from the Reconstruction Court, not only are they numerous, not only do they represent a new level of activism on the part of the Supreme Court, but they also leave us with legacies uh, sometimes very unpleasant legacies, uh, in dealing with the development of equality and rights uh, as, as we find them and are dealing with them today. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Sinha, feel free to also, if, if there's anything you'd like to say about the Reconstruction yeah. Court's legacy in these early years, please weigh in, you know, with that. But also, you know, I, to transitioning just to modern questions around the Reconstruction Amendments, you know, you signed on to a scholar brief in the recent affirmative action cases. Um, you know, broadly speaking, you know, as an historian of this era, I'd just be curious for your thoughts on how your reading of the history uh, of Reconstruction informs how you look at some of the current debates we see on the Supreme Court, whether it's affirmative action or whether you want to take it in other directions as well. Yes, I did sign on to an amicus brief uh, in the recent Supreme Court uh, cases against uh, Harvard um, and against UNC in the affirmative action cases. Um, so the historians are on record there. Um, but I will say that, you know, um, uh, you know, following on Professor Gelser's remarks, uh, that the Supreme Court of the United States has played an extremely sorry role uh, in the dismantling of Reconstruction, played an extremely sorry role. Um, you think of uh, the way Lincoln talked about the Roger Tawney Court with the Dred Scott decision, um, and then you think of Plessy versus Ferguson. And the road to Plessy versus Ferguson begins indeed with the slaughterhouse cases yeah. that completely uh, dismantles this new vision of national citizenship uh, that the 14th Amendments and the new federal civil rights laws uh, implement. And even more than the slaughterhouse cases, in 1876, United States versus Reese, uh, that uh, completely dismantles the right to vote for black men um, and, and legitimizes these tactics that Southern states would use to disenfranchise black men 
poll taxes, et cetera, that were not explicitly racial, um, but also the Crookshack decision that says that, you know, um, that the federal government cannot intervene, uh, that if there are uh, violations of civil and political rights by uh, private individuals, then this, you know, the federal government will not intervene. This is under the purview of the state. Uh, it's only in the case of state action or state neglect that the federal government would intervene. So completely going back to an antiquated notion of states' rights that in fact the reconstruction amendments and laws had challenged. So the Supreme Court seems, um, it's not even so much a question of judicial review or even ju judicial activism so much as a real intent, it seems, to dismantle those reconstruction laws and amendments. Now, oddly enough, in the 1880s, there are some court decisions where they actually rule in favor of black rights. Uh, Strouder versus West Virginia, black men should be in juries. Um, ex parte Yarborough and others where you can't just go and murder people just because they're exercising the right to vote uh, or belong to a political party that you don't like. Uh, and so they, they do make a couple of those cases. Unfortunately, the precedents that are formed, they form a bad precedent and then keep evoking the bad precedent to set more bad precedent uh, is Slaughterhouse, it's Crookshank. And then the civil rights cases of 1883 that um, declared the Civil Rights Act of 1875, Sumner's dying legacy uh, to the country and to Congress uh, and for, for all American citizens that actually declared Jim Crow un, you know, un, illegal, unlawful, even before Jim Crow was actually instituted in the South. And the Supreme Court of the Civil Rights Cases in 1883 says, well, that's unconstitutional. And from there, it's a straight line to Fessy versus Ferguson. Uh, among the lawyers today, and even among historians, who reads those majority opinions? We all read Justice John Marshall Harlan's dissents, because in a way, they are the ones that formed ultimately the lo long lasting precedent. He's the one who wins history. He may have lost in, in law in, in those decisions, uh, but those are the ones that we read today. Um, so I really think the Supreme Court of the United States, except for that very brief moment in Brown versus Board of Education, has tended to be extremely hidebound in its interpretation of our Constitution and the Reconstruction Amendments, and has many times done, you know, past decisions that has whittled down the intent to establish racial equality. And that was true of this case, too. Uh, you know, who can't be for a colorblind society? We all want that. That is the goal that Frederick Douglass had. That is the goal that most uh, people who want to see racial equality and justice have. Uh, but to argue that the reconstruction law and amendments or the federal agencies put specifically in place to safeguard the rights of freed people had nothing to do with protecting um, uh, black people's rights, which were under assault, as Professor Gelzo has put it, with the black codes, but also by a regime of racial terror, um, with the foundation found forming of the Ku Klux Klan and other white terror groups in the South uh, at this point. Um, to argue that that they have nothing to do in terms of racial redress is is I think um, is specious historically, um, and I think it is really unfortunate that the debate over affirmative action has become a debate over do we count race or not, or it's about diversity without looking at the long history of these issues and the ways in which we today as a modern democracy are still trying to address and still trying to live up to our ideals of equal citizenship, regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Sadly, we're coming to the end of our discussion here. I could talk to both of you all day. So I'll, I'll give the final word here to Alan Gelso. Just sort of the, the same broad question that I had asked uh, Professor Sinha, you know, as an historian of the Civil War and Reconstruction, how does that inform how you read the Constitution today and address, you know, ongoing issues that we're finding in America, whether it's, you know, affirmative action, which we just saw before the court, where we saw the two sides of the court contesting the history of Reconstruction as it relates to that issue, but also more broadly. Well, being a historian, I tend not to have a whole lot to say about present day because people who talk in the present day about issues then often found themselves 
rather embarrassed when the events that would eventually succeed the present day um, showed them to be in somewhat less favorable light. So I, I like to be cautious as, as a historian this way. Uh, I sometimes say that I probably know more about the politics of the 1860s than I know about the politics of last week. And in that case, what I see when I look at the jurisprudence of the Civil War and Reconstruction eras is I see a tremendous amount of complexity. Now, when I look at the 14th Amendment, I see five, four, four different sections doing five different things. And I'm wondering, how do we translate those into the immediate context of today? Especially since we don't even have reliable materials that tell us what was on the minds of the people who were constructing the 14th Amendment. I mean, the 14th Amendment comes out of the Joint Committee on Reconstruction, but we don't really have substantial documentation on what they thought they were doing. Even John Bingham, who's often seen as the architect of the 14th Amendment, Bingham gives different readings on what parts of that amendment meant at different times. So we have been, in a way, struggling with a consequence of the American Civil War and with Reconstruction ever since. I mean, we're 160 years beyond the immediate events of the war, and yet we are still living with them. And I suspect we will continue to live with them and wrestle them with them and, and struggle to see where the light of justice and equality is going to take us. I do think, though, that the history of these events and the history of the Reconstruction Amendments gives us important guidance, but it's guidance that will only help us to come to our own decisions, our own decisions guided by our sense of justice, our sense of equality, our sense of what it is to enjoy the privilege of being the citizen of a republic. And when we grasp that, we've grasped, I think, what really is at stake in the 14th Amendment. Because the most fundamental and important thing the 14th Amendment does is to define what a citizen is and can be. And understanding the preciousness of that, that acquisition, of that realization, that's a genuine accomplishment. It's one we try to live with today, and I think we should continue to try to live up with. And I, I know I can speak for Professor Sinha as well. Both of us are part of that long journey that we have been taking since 1865 to bind up those wounds, to live at peace with ourselves, as Lincoln said, and with the whole world. The superb uh, end to our conversation. So Manisha Sinha, Alan Gelzo, for sharing your historical and constitutional wisdom with all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you for having us.